Hello and welcome to the review of West Respiratory Physiology textbook and we're covering the final chapter today. Well done, you did it, we made it to the end. And this last chapter goes over the tests of pulmonary function. It's really a review of a lot of concepts that we've already talked about in the book with a couple extra gems interspersed in between as well. So we'll take it nice and slow and uh, we won't belabor the points we've already covered in other chapters and try to just cover on these new points while reviewing just briefly some of those older points. If you haven't already, check out the Patreon link within the description where you can find access to exclusive content as well regarding this textbook including transcripts, audio files, and we'll also eventually be releasing some multi-choice exams for this textbook and other medical physiology textbooks as well. So as we mentioned already, so as we've mentioned already, this chapter is covering some tests of pulmonary function. The reason why you want to test your pulmonary function is for multiple reasons. So you may want to evaluate chronic dyspnea, you may want to evaluate the response to a treatment, monitor disease progression, or evaluate the fitness for surgical procedures. Maybe it's a part of a research or epidemiological survey. There are multiple reasons for trying to see how well the pulmonary system is working in, in a particular subject. The primary role for these tests is for chronic respiratory problems, not acute issues and they really provide a definitive diagnosis. It's more just giving you a feature of their breathing pattern or their dyspnea. So the first test we're gonna talk about is the test of ventilation, starting off with forced expiration. You would have seen this curve before, flow volume curves that we had mentioned in chapter seven. This is using spirometry, you take a deep breath in, and then you breathe out as fast as you can. Remember that breathe out is restricted because you collapse your small bronchioles and you get this curve as your airways, your lower airways collapse. You have some features of obstructive and restrictive diseases, however. Obstructive, that's an issue of breathing air out. Consequently, you store a lot of air within your lungs, so you start to operate at higher lung volumes. That also helps to dilate your airways and helps with the obstructive disease to get that air out. So obstructive disease, you're operating at higher lung volumes. That means you have a lower compliance at this portion. So your flow rate is going to be a lot smaller as well, or at least you're going to have a smaller inspiratory flow. With restrictive diseases, that's an issue with breathing in. So that means you are operating at lower lung volumes. But look at this curve for your expiratory curve. That's the same as a normal person because expiration isn't a problem. Remember, restrictive diseases are like pulmonary fibrosis. Obstructive diseases are more like asthma. And as a reminder, we have this value, which is the forced expiratory volume in one second, which is going to be reduced with any airway resistance or reduction in elastic recoil. And then we have the ratio between your forced expiratory volume at one second to your forced vital capacity. This is going to be reduced with obstructive diseases but actually somewhat increased with restrictive diseases. So we talked about that once again back in chapter seven, uh, but just as a little reminder there. Lung volumes can also be measured. We've discussed this once again in previous chapters. And your functional residual capacity, which is one of those volumes, can be measured by helium dilution or body plasmography. And you can also measure your anatomic dead space using the Fowler's method discussed back in chapter two, I believe. You can measure your diffusing capacity of the lung, but remember this is really only done for carbon monoxide since oxygen is more difficult to measure. Blood flow within the pulmonary circulation is measured by the fixed principle using the indicated dilution method. And then that brings us over to ventilation perfusion relationships. So the regional differences in ventilation and blood flow, once again, is measured using radioactive xenon. But then when it comes to the actual inequality of ventilation, and globally, there's two methods here, the single breath and the multi-breath method. Single breath method is pretty similar to the Fowler's method of measuring anatomic dead space. And essentially what you're going to do is you're breathing normally, you take a single breath of 100% oxygen and then you expire out and you're just measuring the nitrogen concentration from your normal breathing as it's expired out. With lung disease, you don't get that nice plateau. We'll go into this in more detail a little bit later in this uh, chapter as well, but we also talked to that, about that previously. So it's more that plateau of nitrogen as you're getting your alveolar air out, but that just continues to rise if you have an inequality of ventilation. That's a pretty quick and fast, useful test. 
The multi-breath method is based on the rate of washout of nitrogen. And this is where you're connected to a source of 100% oxygen and you're just measuring how much nitrogen is expired with each breath. It should be that it's reduced with the same fraction at each point. And so it should be a nice kind of linear line. But with lung disease and non-uniform ventilation, that results in a more curved plot because of those differing rates of nitrogen getting diluted within the lungs. And that is shown over here in this figure 10.2 here. You can see with a normal patient, you just have this nice gradual reduction in nitrogen with each breath. This 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on the x-axis here is just showing you each breath. And then you've got nitrogen concentration on the y-axis. There is a way to measure your ventilation perfusion ratios as well, which was introduced by Riley for lung disease. This is based on measurements of your partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide with an arterial and expired gas. Just as a refresher, this brings us to the alveolar arterial PO2 difference, our AA gradient. Remember, this is based on what your ideal alveolar PO2 would be. Now, we also do have this oxygen carbon dioxide diagram here, oxygen on the x-axis, carbon dioxide on the y-axis. And this is really relating to whether you have a high or low V Q mismatch. The point I is ideal, the normal rate. As you start going forward here, this is representing a high VQ mismatch. So PO2 is getting higher, PCO2 is getting lower. This is because you have a lot of ventilation, meaning that you're absorbing a lot of oxygen, you're getting rid of a lot of carbon dioxide relative to how much blood flow is present. If you go backwards, this is a low VQ mismatch. So PO2 is reducing and PCO2 is increasing. This is like a right to left shunt. So you're unable to get rid of your carbon dioxide or absorb your oxygen as efficiently. Another two indices of your VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion inequality. One is your physiological shunt. So remember this equation, your flow of your physiological shunt divided by the flow of your total blood flow. So this effectively tells you how much blood is actually shunting and how much of an issue this is going to be. And then the other indice is your alveolar dead space. Alveolar dead space is once again, all of those alveoli that have high ventilation but no perfusion. So they're not participating in gas exchange. So there is this equation here that shows the proportion of how much your alveoli ventilation is actually dead space ventilation compared to your total ventilation. So this is equation is the partial pressure of inspired carbon dioxide minus the partial pressure of alveolar carbon dioxide divided by your inspired carbon dioxide. Now the result is your alveolar dead space, which is different to your anatomical dead space. Remember anatomical dead space is all of the portions of the respiratory tract that cannot participate in gas exchange no matter what that happens. There's no alveoli there. So trachea, your nose, your bronchi, et cetera. So it's, it's different to that. It's all the regions that should be participating in gas exchange, but are not. It's quite hard to differentiate the expired alveolar gas from that that's been contaminated with your anatomic dead space, however, because obviously it's all coming from the same region. You're measuring only from the mouth. So it's, it's quite hard to know uh, which is going to be your dead space. So instead the result is that you call this your physiological dead space, or at least you can use the physiological dead space equation to account for the fact that it's quite hard to differentiate what's truly alveolar dead space and what is anatomic. So physiological dead space, it's a similar equation where you have your physiological dead space being divided by your total ventilation. But the equation here is your partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide minus expired carbon dioxide divided by arterial carbon dioxide. The normal value for physiological dead space is 30% of tidal volume at rest and is typically mostly anatomical dead space. But it can increase up to 50% with ventilation perfusion inequality or mismatch. So that is your main measurements of of ventilation. Next, we're going to get to our blood gases and pH. This is your acid base balance and is quite vital for knowing whether you have a respiratory issue. So, you measure your PO2, your PCO2, and your pH. 
They're quite easily measured. There's different electrodes that can measure each one, but they can all be included into one test. So you just get some blood, drop it into a little port. All of those electrodes are going to measure those three variables and then spit out um, all of the numbers. So it's quite an easy test to be done. You just need a little bit of blood. And then that can tell you whether or not you have some kind of abnormality with your breathing. If you have an acidosis with a high PCO2, clearly you're hypoventilating or you have at least got a respiratory acidosis and so on. So in chapter five, remember, we also talked about four reasons for low arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So if you measure that oxygen and suddenly you realize, oh, they're actually hypoxemic, your four reasons include hypoventilation, diffusion impairment, shunt, or ventilation perfusion inequality. The kind of fifth one, which is one that you should also think about, is just a reduction in your inspired oxygen. So for example, that's going to be high altitude. There's some other features that can tell you whether it's hypoventilation versus diffusion impairment for your cause of hypoxemia. So for example, hypoventilation, you'll also have a high PCO2. If you have a shunt, that's not going to respond to 100% oxygen, whereas the other ones they will somewhat respond to 100% oxygen. Diseased lungs, this is the tricky one because they're going to have both impaired diffusion and ventilation perfusion inequality. So those two are a little bit more difficult to differentiate. If you have high PCO2, the causes for that are hypoventilation and ventilation perfusion inequality. We quite exhaustively already talked about how with ventilation perfusion inequality, your PCO2 may go up. But usually you actually start to uh, ventilate more to drop that and you're able to drop that quite fast and keep that nice and stable, whereas your oxygen isn't able to uh, respond like that. You don't get that same dramatic increase in oxygen because of those differences in the dissociation curves. So you may not always see carbon dioxide retention with ventilation perfusion inequality. Next, we're going to talk about the mechanics of breathing. So lung compliance. This is the volume change per unit of pressure change. Uh, to obtain this, you really just need to know your intrapleural pressure. To calculate your intrapleural pressure, you just chuck a pressure probe within your esophagus. It's not perfect, but you're able to at least somewhat measure the pressure within the esophagus, which is kind of within that pleural space somewhat. Figure 10.4 here is showing us that if we have a region of lung that is partially obstructed, we can get this pendulum effect where this obstruction means that this one obstructed alveoli doesn't expand as much. So then during expiration, where the non-obstructed alveoli are much larger, some of that gas actually goes into that smaller obstructed alveoli during expiration. So it actually starts to fill on expiration still. So inspiration occurs, both are getting big and then during expiration, there's actually continued filling of the obstructed alveoli. And then eventually, once they're the same size, then that obstructed alveoli also empties uh, on expiration. So that's the pendulum effect. If you increase your breathing frequency, that amount of tidal volume that's kind of doing this weird extra filling of the obstructed region becomes smaller and smaller. So that means that that obstructed region no longer really participates, so then doesn't really expand uh, on inspiration and you know reduce on expiration. So as you breathe faster and faster, that means lung compliance appears to get lower. So you get a less compliant appearing lung because portions of your lungs aren't actually expanding at all. So the volume isn't changing with that change in pressure. Airway resistance is measured by evaluating the pressure difference between the alveoli and the mouth per unit airflow. So remember resistance equals pressure divided by flow. That's just Ohm's law. So the pressure between your alveoli and mouth is the pressure at the numerator of the equation. Then the denominator of that equation flow is going to be airflow. And this is measured using a body plethysmograph. So what you're going to do is that at the onset of inspiration, you're kind of sitting in this box, right? So you've got pre-inspiration sitting in this box. We've got our alveoli. The volume and pressure within this box is known. And according to Boyle's law, if there's a change in volume and pressure in one unit, there's going to be an equal change in volume and pressure in the second unit in a closed system. So during inspiration, alveolar pressure reduces, volume increases, meaning that within the box, volume is going to decrease and pressure is going to increase 
respectively. That means you can calculate that pressure within the alveoli because you know the pressure that increased in this box and vice versa with expiration too. So you can figure out the pressure. Flow is measured simultaneously. So now you have pressure and you have flow. You can calculate your airway resistance as well because you have all those components. Closing volume is a new measurement that we haven't covered in this book yet. This is something that can identify kind of early disease and small airways using that nitrogen washout like we had talked about just slightly earlier in this chapter where you, you're breathing normally, you've got nitrogen mixing in with your lungs and then you take a breath of 100% oxygen. That's going to fill up all your anatomic dead space and then slightly start to diffuse into some of the alveoli. You breathe out this first portion that has no nitrogen in it, that's all your anatomical dead space. The second portion with the rise in nitrogen as you expire, this is a mixture of dead space and alveolar gas. And then you hit the plateau. This plateau is pure alveolar gas. And then we hit this fourth region where we have an abrupt increase in nitrogen concentration. This is because the base of the lung starts to collapse and you're preferentially now emptying the apex of the lungs which remember have less ventilation. So there's less oxygen mixing with the nitrogen in the apex. So right at that closing volume portion, which is region number four, the apex, when you breathed in 100% oxygen, didn't really ventilate. So you didn't get that much oxygen in there. So it's full of nitrogen. And then as you're breathing out, the base of the lung starts to collapse. So you get less airflow from the base of the lung. You get more airflow from the apex of the lung, the top of the lung. And that top of the lung has higher nitrogen concentration. So then your nitrogen starts to increase right at the end of this expiration. In normal people or people without pulmonary disease, the closing volume is 10% of your vital capacity. This steadily increases with age and can get up to 40% of your vital capacity. But with small amounts of disease of the small airways, this can increase your closing volume. So you can measure this closing volume and figure out whether or not you have early disease of the small airways. Next, we're talking about the control of ventilation. This is really just saying that you can evaluate the responsiveness of the chemoreceptors and the respiratory center to carbon dioxide by just having someone breathe into or rebreathe into a bag. So that's just going to increase the carbon dioxide levels. You can alter that so you can provide oxygen so oxygen doesn't reduce. So you're just measuring the carbon dioxide responsiveness or you can keep carbon dioxide equal and just reduce your partial pressure of oxygen so you can evaluate the responsiveness to hypoxemia as well. So that is your control of ventilation. Exercise, this is where you're really evaluating the reserve of the lung because remember the resting lung has enormous reserves. So you're just evaluating how much reserves you have. So that includes for ventilation, blood flow, oxygen and carbon dioxide transfer and the diffusing capacity, all of which can increase several folds. So you pop someone on a treadmill or bicycle, you make them exercise steadily, then you measure your total ventilation, respiratory frequency, pulse rate, blood pressure, ECG, oxygen uptake, carbon dioxide output, respiratory exchange ratio, and arterial blood gases. So you're just evaluating how well you're able to compensate for the demands of exercise effectively. And then that brings us to the end of the chapter and the end of the book. So well done for getting this far. We have key concepts and our questions, which once again, we will have the answers to these questions within the description. Once again, feel free to check out the Patreon link within the description as you can find exclusive content there. Otherwise, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this textbook and feel free to drop a comment.